Uh, I'm using Chua, CTO co-founder of Cake DeFi. I've been in Bitcoin uh, since 2010, uh, active in the Bitcoin Ethereum ecosystem from the early days. Uh, I was the chief architect of Sand Dollar, if you know what's uh, on the CBDC side. So uh, there was a retail CBDC in Bahamas, uh, the first one in the world. And they're still operating today. Um, so I was the chief architect of that. Uh, and I tried the first Bitcoin on LLC uh, since 2010, if you know, that was like even before Mt. Gox, or just early days of Mt. Gox, I was trading a lot on IRC. This is a channel to go. I think it probably still exists right now. The server is Freenode, so go to Freenode and go to this channel. You can still, I'm not sure you can still trade it, but there was most of the trading happening on that channel and never got scammed once. It was great. <laughs> so for me, I'm going to talk mainly about the tech side, on what the key updates for the blockchain, for these three uh, major blockchains that I Follow very closely, just want to give everyone updates on what's going on in this three blockchain. So one, we have this, uh, the Ethereum, the second one we have Bitcoin, and the third one we have DeFi chain. So I'm not going to talk too much about the price and the market. Uh, Julian will talk a lot more on the market, how it ties with the market. So I'm just going to kind of give an update on the, on the tech side. Right? So one of the major news on Ethereum last um, Week, that's why I got so many barbecue invites because of the Chappelle upgrade, the Shanghai and Capella upgrades. Because the key thing now on the Ethereum side is because you can now, if you stake Ethereum on the beacon chain, you can now withdraw your Ethereum and you can actually spend them. You can actually barbecue them right now. So, Chappelle, it's a made up word that comes up, uh, that, that's combined of uh, Shanghai and Capella. So, Shanghai. So on, on the Ethereum side, there's two layers. So on the Ethereum layer, the upgrade is known as Shanghai. It now accepts withdrawal from the beacon chain. And then on the Capella side, it now allows withdrawal. So there's a two chain. One is allowing, the other one is accepting. This is the main one. So if, you, if you're holding, if you're holding ERC20, it's on this layer. And on this layer, it's on the making sure that the blockchain goes forward. You're doing the mining. You're doing the validation and you're staking your ETH, so it's on this layer. But now you can move from this side to this side, you can move from this side to this side. Sorry, this side to, from the EVM layer to Beacon Chain, you can, you can already did that two and a half years back when Beacon Chain was launched. But it's only one way, you can only go one way. But for the first time from last week or, or five days ago, they can move from Capella, I mean you can move from Beacon Chain to, to the main chain. And so a lot of fear, in the, uh, in the overall market that there, was a, there could be a potential crash of a serum that's coming because all these stakers have been staking for the last two years and now for the first time they can now withdraw and there will be a huge sellout. So this is kind of like the graph that you see for the last um, week and these are the entries. So the, at before, before 13, there was no withdrawal possible but now with the Chappelle upgrade, you can now withdraw. So you can see this is the entry and this is the, the outgoing. So yes, for, you can see a lot of outgoing. And you can see a lot of outgoing, again, uh, two days ago, a lot of outgoing. But one thing that you can see, this is a net. So the blue line is a net supply on the beacon chain. Right? So how many are, uh, is going up because there's no out anyway. So future draw is going down, obviously it's going down. But now it's key thing, you can see for the last day or so, it's going up now. So, the thing that we all expect to happen, that there's a huge withdrawal, I think it's kind of like not happening. Like we do see, yeah, sure, there's a few withdrawal for the last like three days or four days. And that's it. It died out faster than, faster than I expect, to be honest. I would expect it to go on for weeks and not months, but it's just a couple of days. And now you can see Ethereum, it's, it's going up. And we have more net deposit or, uh, into staking than outgoing. So great. Uh, and if you're, if you're staking ETH and you are, if you haven't withdrawn, so the time for you to withdraw, because you need to join a queue, right? Because uh, it's first in, first out, so you join a queue. There was a, there was a chatter that it could take like months for you to withdraw because there's so many people expecting to withdraw. But the actual uh, queue time is about four days. So that's actually really, really short. So it's kind of like no, no penalty. When you just go in and out, you can just withdraw anytime. And uh, other key things on the Ethereum side, uh, rollout layer two. People have been talking about that for a while as well. Uh, Arbitrum, Optimism, we we'll see a lot of uh, layer twos on the Ethereum side. So these are all technologies to help, uh, to help users to use Ethereum in a more faster and cheaper way because you're running it on a separate blockchain. 
And this is where a lot of people do not realize that these are actually separate blockchains. They are not Ethereum. What they do is they then combine the, the, the transactions and then post it on chain. It may not validate entirely. It's just kind of like batch it and then someone has to disprove if anything is wrong. There's like a, like a window that you can disprove. So they re rely on bridges to go from Ethereum to all these blockchains. So these are the secondary blockchains. And one of the key things on the Ethereum side, which to make it even more efficient for layer two, I mean, layer two alone is already pretty efficient, but to make it even more efficient is to create this space, kind of like a white space where you can then have, because all these layer twos have to then post things on the Ethereum side. It eats up a lot of space. And these things do not need to be there because they're just there to allow for stakers to dispute, right? So someone on the Ethereum side uh, proposed this, um, improvement called dank sharding. So dank sharding is like creating of this white space on Ethereum that allows all these layer two to post their proof and post a batch transaction there and the proof there. And once it passes the validation period, you can actually prune them because you don't need them anymore. Why? Because right now on blockchain, everything, is on, everything in blockchain stays forever. And all these layer twos are posting stuff there, just eating up on this space on blockchain and bloating blockchain unnecessary. So with dank sharding, you can have all these proofs on the blockchain and then prune them after it's done. So it will make Ethereum so much lighter, so much faster, and rely on layer two to make everything a lot, uh, a lot better. So this is coming, uh, so there's two steps on this as well. I think there's one coming this year and there's another one probably coming in two years, the more like a full uh, version of that, it's gonna have a kind of like a half, halfway version of that kind of like uh, this year, I think. And the account abstraction layer. So. Another cool improvement as well on, on Ethereum side, um, they're working on that already. So on Ethereum side right now, if you use Ethereum, there's only one type of private key involved on Ethereum side, which is a retail single signature user level private key. You can't do any like a multi-sig, you can't do any, um, any like a institutional way of running things on, on Ethereum. But the workaround of that, because Ethereum has EVM layer, you can write any application, any smart contracts you want. So what people do is that they write in the application, they kind of do multi-sig on Ethereum by using smart contracts. So you're still signing everything on chain and you can still um, do everything. But the downside of this is very expensive because every time you want to sign a transaction, you have to commit on chain and everything else is kind of like designed for a single user kind of mode. So you have to kind of like hack it around. So, but on Bitcoin, there is a consensus level multi-sig uh, capability that it is not a smart contract. It's kind of like the address where when you submit multiple signature, you submit it not on chain, you submit it with each other. And once you have enough signature, you then push it on chain. So that makes it so much cheaper because you don't have to submit things that are not going to get approved. So Ethereum is going to go this way as well. So the, the name is called account abstraction, where the account structure is not going to be appear on chain. So it's off chain. You're going to sign, you're going to create whatever structure you want on how to manage your address. And once you sign it, you push it on chain. Once you get enough signature, otherwise you don't even push it on chain. So that makes Ethereum even more efficient, even more institutional ready, even safer. And uh, you can have even like, um, quantum proof um, 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 crypto cryptography uh, if you want to. So you can have all this thing on your account section layer without, uh, without having to care about uh, does the blockchain support it, does the EVM support it, so you can do all that uh, outside. So these are the cool things on, on the Ethereum side. So I think a lot of people, I mean the last two years we've been talking about Chappella, talking about the merge, talking about Beacon Chain, now we have, the, we have that now, so what's next? I think there's still a lot more things. I've only covered a few things on Ethereum side. There's still a lot more things to come on Ethereum side. It doesn't end here. It's gonna make, so sharding and all that's gonna come and it's gonna make Ethereum way more efficient. Um, yeah, and ZK, so I don't, I don't even cover that in my talk today because I covered it on the last time. So a lot more things come on Ethereum side. Um, yeah, Ethereum's gonna get really exciting. Moving on uh, to Bitcoin. I don't even expect to have this screen when we have Bitcoin up there because Bitcoin is also being the boring coin uh, store of value, basically just store of uh, kind of like gold where you can do anything. There's no, no smart contracts, no EVM, no, no nothing. But what's capturing on the Bitcoin space last month or so, it's these uh, punks, these uh, um, NFTs even. 
So the creator of, so these are known as ordinals, right? So the creator of ordinals doesn't like it to, to be called NFT, so they want it to be called ordinals. I mean, there's some reason why is that so. Um, but it has been capturing the Bitcoin uh, scene in the last month or so. And uh, we have a lot of Ethereum, uh, a lot of ordinals right now happening on the Ethereum side, 1 million and counting now on, on, on Bitcoin. And Bitcoin block before ordinals took off was less than one megabyte, but now we hardly see any blocks that's less than two megabytes now. And sometimes we even see three or even up to capacity, up, up to limit of four megabytes. Uh, so we have huge block, blocks now. And, uh, it kind of split it, uh, the Bitcoin community into, uh, into uh, half as well because some is kind of like, ah, Bitcoin should not be used to do things like that. It should only be used for accounting and not used for like, uh, all these like, toys that, that, <laughs> that you play around. It's, uh, Bitcoin space is um, just kind of sacred in the, to, to, to those people, right? So I'm going to explain a bit of what are Bitcoin or knows. Bitcoin or knows, if you know the... the the, what ordinals mean in, the, in, the, in math is basically just like the first, second, third, and all that. So ordinals basically just mean an ordering of Satoshi. So if you don't know what Satoshi is, Satoshi is the smallest unit in Bitcoin. Every Bitcoin is, you can split that into 100 million uh, Satoshi, and there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. So the total amount of Satoshis will be uh, 21, 6 because of a million, and then 8 is the Satoshi per Bitcoin, so that's 21 quadrillion Satoshi ever existed throughout the rest of time. Right now, I think we have 19 quadrillion uh, Satoshis out there today, and all of them are numbered from the first one ever minted all the way to the current one. So all that is clearly numbered and clearly tracked. So it's kind of a game for ordinals to kind of track every single Satoshi on where it goes. Does it go to this address? Does it go to that address? And so what the next thing that the creator of Ornos did, this was even before NFT, even before inscription happened, before actually allowing you to attach image. So the creator of Ornos, his name is Casey, wanted to create some kind of a game uh, around the scheme that he designed. Right? So just kind of assign some rarities to, to Ornos. So you can kind of create like, if, there's a, if the number ends with like a mod of something, then it's, uh, it's, it's uncommon if you mod and like divide by, let's say, uh, a nice prime number and enter zero, then it's a, it's a rare. And you can see there's only one mystic one, and you can kind of guess uh, which one's the mystic one. Uh, the very, very first Satoshi, owned by Satoshi himself with a capital S, uh, that will probably never, ever be moved. Uh, so if you get that, then you can, you'll literally uh, Satoshi himself if you, if you actually own that. And yeah, even for this scheme, you can kind of go to the website, ornos.com, kind of see where, how, how to track that. So if you have Bitcoin, you can run it through an odd server, you can kind of see which one you actually own. It's really rare to find any even uncommon uh, Satoshis, uh, Ornos uh, out there today. It's, uh, most of them are, are common. So that makes it kind of interesting. But then it did not take off, even though it's kind of a game, it did not take off. So what really took off was when Ornos supports, uh, supports um, Inscription, support images, support attachment even. So almost um, as about, I would say, three months back maybe, like you can then start attaching uh, binary, attaching data to Satoshi. So how it works is basically on Bitcoin side, there's already this white space. We, when we talk about that on the Ethereum side, so on Bitcoin side, there's already a white space on the Bitcoin side that was unused for a long time. It was called witness space. It was used for other function but not, not used much. But this guy is really clever to say, okay, doesn't this space is unused anyway, so why not we do something with it? We're just gonna put in some data in there. Most of the clients are gonna ignore that, but if you have an all-nodes client, you can kind of download the data and render the image. So you can attach sound, you can attach text, you can attach uh, images, you can attach anything to that, to, that, um, to that space, and you can attach to every single Satoshi so you, that, that you own. Obviously, you have to pay on Bitcoin to attach that because all this thing goes on a blockchain and you need to pay for that, right? So the content is fully on chain, on ordinals. It's very unlike on the Ethereum counterpart because on the Ethereum counterpart, usually it's a link to an image that's, else, uh, that's elsewhere. It could even be a link to a, to a physical object that you own. But on Bitcoin or no, it has to be on chain. It cannot be outside of, outside of the blockchain itself. So it makes it immutable. There's no external link. Obviously, you can still kind of say that you can support externally, but, but if you want to go with strict ordinals, 
definition or no, then no, it, you cannot have an external link. It has to be fully on chain. It has to be, um, it has to be uh, immutable. You cannot even change that. So once it's script it is described, that's it. That's your Satoshi has animated. You cannot change that anymore. So you can pass it around, but you cannot change that anymore. So yeah, so inscription basically just an attachment of uh, text, audio, image, and movie uh, onto a onto a Satoshi. So we did one, just to kind of give it a try. Uh, so we had that uh, all nodes now inscripted with our uh, slogan. And it's fully on chain. Theoretical sites is uh, four megabytes. So if you want to put something there, you have to compress it to four megabytes. And with four megabytes, it's going to be hard to mine though because that's a that's a theoretical block size. So you you need to make sure that you pay enough fees to make sure the miner only mine one one of your transactions, nothing else. Um, so with all nodes, what's, what comes next? So just like NFT, you want to start trading them. So trading of all the nodes, it's, it's, it's unlike Ethereum where you have the full smart contract to do whatever you want, but trading on all nodes is not going to be straightforward because it's on Bitcoin space. But we did think about that and how we can make it fully trustless on the trading side. So it's actually possible because on Bitcoin, if you know how Bitcoin UTXO system works, well, UTXO stands for unspent transaction uh, output. So basically how it works is kind of like, uh, kind of like your paper note, right? So if, if you have two $5 notes, you walk to a, to a store, you say, I want, I want a coffee, the coffee costs $6, so you're gonna give the two $5 note to the store, and then, and then you're gonna pay the, the, the store $6, you're gonna get $4 back as a change. So that's two $5 input and six is an output, six and four is an output. So on Bitcoin, that's how it works. So you can kind of make Ornos fit it that way because Ornos, if you recall, it's basically just Satoshi. So on a Bitcoin system, you can have a seller of an ordinal as one of the input and then the buyer of an ordinal as one of the input as well. And then you do a swap. So the input becomes the output, the, uh, the owner of the ordinal becomes the output, and then you just do a swap, literally. So, you, so what it does, it basically just you're trading one Satoshi for more Satoshis. If you're the buyer of the Satoshi, you're just paying more Satoshis for that one Satoshi with the inscription. And if you're the seller, you're just selling one Satoshi for more Satoshis, right? So that's kind of how it works. And Bitcoin UTXO model fits perfectly on that one. Um, yeah, so how it works on blockchain, either buyer or seller can partially sign a transaction, pass it over to the other party, if the other party agrees with that, signs it, completes it, broadcasts it on blockchain, it works. So there's no counterparty needed. There's no, there's no intermediary needed to facilitate this transfer. It's all peer-to-peer, -peer, all just within two parties, just like how Bitcoin is intended. But then we have one more problem to solve on all nodes. So we have trading now. How do we have marketplace? So if you have, you want to, so for all nodes, you, if you, can, you can trade, but you need to find someone that's willing to buy or sell your, your all nodes. So you need a marketplace for that. Right, so the marketplace, how we can make it work is by having Sado protocol. It's something that we uh, came up with. It's, it's a fully trustless, fully decentralized marketplace that allows owners, owner to buy and sell to trade, uh, to trade on those. So we are going to push this out as an open source project. There's no tokens. There's no uh, nothing for it. It's kind of like a, just a, an open source uh, contribution from, uh, from us to, um, to the world to all nodes and to Bitcoin users. So how it works is you can basically use IPFS, uh, interplanetary file system to kind of broadcast your intention to buy or sell all nodes. And then uh, Seda protocol is self-authenticating. It also check that you actually own the all node that you broadcast. So you need to make sure that uh, any buyer and seller actually owns that. And I don't, I'm not gonna go through the, the technical details, but it's kind of like how that works by combining uh, two technologies, IPFS and Bitcoin, and all fully trustless, fully automated, fully um, decentralized. Not even us has owned that. And this order book, it's global. So if we have a site that trades on this order book and someone else implement the same protocol, we're gonna share the same order book with the person. So that makes it really great. Um, yeah, it's an example of the uh, order book. It's a public order book, so you can trade uh, on that. And uh, Sado protocol is free and open source. It's self-authenticating, all signatures are validated independently if you parse the, the, the order book. And it has a default global order book. So if you trade on Sado protocol, you're gonna share the same order book. So what we intend to do, what we intend to have is to have a global trustless uh, ordinal marketplace where different sites gonna speak the same language and we can have the same order book trades uh, globally and that will make it 
really fun, right? And it also supports alternative order books as well if you want to. So the program is very, uh, very um, versatile. And we're going to launch this soon, also an open source, uh, also an open project that we have uh, that uses the SATO protocol. It's called Oddsar. It's non-custodial. You own your own Bitcoin. Uh, you don't have to upload any, uh, you don't have to deposit any Bitcoin. You just go to the website, you trade your own nodes using SATO protocols, fully open, fully trustless. And um, yeah, uh, there's some challenges that we have to fix because the UX on Bitcoin side is a bit harder than Ethereum because Ethereum, uh, it's so developer friendly. You have all these like wallets, you have MetaMask and all that ready, but on Bitcoin, you don't have all of that. So there's things that we need to build along the way to make sure that it's more user friendly uh, for a, a non-technical user to use. So, yeah, moving on to the third blockchain, uh, that's DeFi chain, um, Jellyfish at the back, because that's uh, kind of like the mascot of uh, Jellyfish. Also, this icon is kind of like, a, have a nickname of a Jellyfish YouTube. Okay, the other way, then it looks like Jellyfish. The other way, then it looks like a smiley. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so on DeFi chain, DeFi chain side, one of the key updates is MetaChain that's going to come really, really soon. So what MetaChain does, if you follow DeFi chain, what DeFi chain has been doing, it's, it's, uh, it's like Bitcoin. So everything on DeFi chain before MetaChain was on a consensus level. If you want to trade DeFi, you want to trade, uh, you want to do like swap, you want to trade tokens, all that's happening on the consensus layer. Uh, it's great, it's safe, it's fast, it's, uh, it's secure, but the downside of that is that you cannot expand it. If you're a builder, if you're a developer on DeFi chain side, all you have to do, all you can do is to build services around DeFi chain. You cannot build anything on the DeFi chain itself. So what the team, uh, what the contributors of DeFi chain has done is to build this meta chain where it introduces EVM, basically um, Ethereum virtual machine to, De to, to DeFi chain to allow DeFi chain to interact with smart contracts that users build. So we're gonna see a lot more things happening on DeFi chain side because of this. We're gonna see games, we're gonna see like NFTs even, we're gonna see a lot more cool stuff that's happening uh, on DeFi chain. And it's very comparable because we just talked about Chappelle as well. It's very, very comparable to, to Ethereum side. I think it's a bit coincidental. Also, I believe that a lot of developers on DeFi chain also kind of like look into the good side of Ethereum and say, yeah, this is something that we can adapt as well. So it's very comparable to Ethereum side because Ethereum has two chains as well, beacon chain and ex execution layer. Execution layer is the one that your smart contract sits at and then beacon chain is the one that you do the staking and you do the mining and all that. So on DeFi chain side, the same with Meta chain as well. DeFi chain will kind of remain the uh, DeFi uh, virtual machine layer where processes all the DeFi transactions on the native side. It also does the consensus block generation. Uh, and then on the EVM side, it allows smart contracts to run. So it's two good things about that. One is it's basically one single blockchain. The second thing is that it creates this cool separation between the user uploadable uh, smart contracts that are native uh, smart contracts on DeFi chain. And so yeah, beta chain, I think the dev has just been uh, launch, I think today or yesterday. So we're gonna see testnet coming soon in the next week or so and mainnet uh, probably coming up very, very soon. So if you follow DeFi chain, check out DeFi chain. I'm really, really looking forward to meta chain going live. Um, going a bit further on DeFi chain. So what's next for DeFi chain? What's, what, what's this whole DeFi chain all about? So if you take a step back on what DeFi chain has after meta chain, is that DeFi chain has this native UTXO support, which is very compatible with Bitcoin, it will soon also have this native EVM support, which is very, very compatible with Ethereum, very compatible with so many other blockchains out there, like Solana, um, Binance Smart Chain, and so many others out, out there. So we have this native consensus layer on the DeFi chain side. And DeFi chain also has a very highly distributed nodes globally. And this is very unique, actually, because many other blockchains do not even have that. Like it's it's very decentralized. Like Bitcoin has about 10,000 nodes. Ethereum has about 5,000 nodes. Because, I mean, running of nodes are, are expensive. So, um, yeah, so DeFi chain has this good um, staking system that allows you to stake and then you can run nodes. And the result of that, we have, DeFi chain has seen very, very uh, distributed nodes globally. So taking out this, what can DeFi chain do to make it an interesting platform for developers to build? So, Shadow Coupling Bridge, 
it's what DeFi chain developers has been talking about. It's, it's all about trying to create, to position DeFi chain, not as a competitor to other blockchains, but kind of like a, a bridge that connects other blockchains in two ways. One is the liquidity. So if you build a DEX, if you build a, a DeFi smart contract, you want to have liquidity across multiple blockchains. And one of the problems that you need to solve are bridges. So if you have a DeFi chain as that bridge, then you can get liquidity from all the different blockchains that are going to allow your smart contract to run, uh, to really capture liquidity from all different blockchains. And the other thing is about well, state. So state for EVM blockchains, if you have, let's say, I know like a, let, let's say a, a betting a smart contract, for instance, like you want to have state this transition from all the different blockchains so you can kind of uh, allow the same smart contract to run on different blockchains. So with DeFi chain, with this sharded coupling bridge, you can allow all these states to transition across multiple bridges. And the way that it works is very, very decentralized because of this wide distributed masternode system. You can have masternode that sees different blockchains and all they have to do is just submit witness proof that this is happening on the other chain and this is what should also relate on DeFi chain. And all of this can be very, very trustless. It's actually very, very similar to layer two sort of theorem because that's also kind of how it works. You submit proof and then someone have to disprove your kind of witness um, submission. If someone disproves that, then you're going to lose your uh, stake. So naturally, because of economical reasons, you're going to have to, you're going to submit a real proof because if someone caught you, then you're going to lose your, lose your stake, right? And this is what also happening right now today on Ethereum. Uh, on DeFi chain is a quantum bridge, so it allows you to go from Ethereum to DeFi chain and more blockchains will be added as well uh, on the liquidity side. Um, yeah, so DeFi chain is kind of like building blocks to allowing, uh, to, to allow cross-chain uh, um, DAPT ecosystem. And one of the things that DeFi chain is built, which I did not put in my slide, is that it's, it's only, currently only adding EVM, but the developers, I the developers have written a piece on that that says that EVM is what is dominant today, but what if EVM is no longer dominant tomorrow? So what are we going to do there? So the Meta chain itself, also the, why, why it's called Meta, because it's not, it's not EVM chain, it's just another chain that supports multiple virtual machines, whatever they come. So if there's a new virtual machine tomorrow, you can just easily just extend to support that new virtual machine and just bring it over to, to DeFi chain. So DeFi chain is now playing kind of a role of a bridge builder to all the different blockchains. Yep, with that, um, thank you. I'm going to pass it over to my co-founder, uh, my partner, Julian, talk about more on the market side. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really great. I'm going to take it from here. We'll actually tag on top of that a bit. And we're going to reflect a bit on, OK, what does this mean as a CEO running a crypto company? I need to kind of have a lot of this decision making in mind. How do we allocate funds? How, do, how aggressive are we in growing the company? Do we have to be super cautious? Obviously, on a personal standpoint, what do I do with my own funds? What do we do with the company treasury? Um, all these things, right? And so I need to kind of have this technical input and then put a little bit of my own spin to that to obviously maximize the returns while lowering the risk. And I think as a good investor, it's always what you're trying to do. So I thought we're going to approach this from a very different angle, how most people approach when they invest. What do most people do when they invest? They go on CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko and they look at the price. And they're like, oh, the price is up. I need to invest. But this actually makes no sense because that means you're simply investing into a ticker. You're simply investing into price. And Good investors don't do that. Good investors invest in value. Now, the difficult part about investing in value is that you cannot look at a price. You actually have to think. And so we're going to try to do that. Can I know who was here at the very beginning of this year at our meetup where we discussed what I'm expecting for Q1? Show of hands. Very few of you, right? Who was not here? Show of hands. Obviously, the entire rest. OK. So the entire meetup, you can watch it so that you can actually see what I'm saying right now is exactly or like concisely what I said. And I made five predictions for the entire year, and I'm summarizing them here. So the very first prediction I made was, we're going to continue seeing the fallout from the collapses of the crypto companies that we have seen last year. Right? So all this entire contagion, we're going to see co the continuation of that. Second thing, macro is going to get worse. Recession and so on, interest rates, real estate, all these things are going to get worse. Number three, 
crypto regulation will increase further. Number four, we're gonna see technical innovation. We're gonna see washout and we're gonna see very, very promising projects going forward. And last but not least, there will always be the chokers. There will always be knowingly unknowns. And there are a lot, a lot of expression marks here for a very specific reason. And you will see what I mean if you kind of pay attention as we go along. So what we're going to do is we're not going to look at the price. We're going to think it's January right now, 1st of January. And we're going to ask ourselves with all this, what is our expectation for if it's end of Q, let's say mid April, what would the prices do with all this? And if you follow our kind of prediction back then, I said, you know what? I'm expecting the markets to go slightly up just also because we had a really, really tough kind of 2022. And that was kind of a bit of my expectation, right? I thought, okay, we're going to see a little bit of the contagion. We're going to see a bit of the macro worsening. We're going to see a bit of the, the fallout regulation. We're going to have known unknowns. This is always key, but we're going to have a bit of a cleanup and a washout. Okay. So let's walk down the rabbit hole and look what happened. Genesis filed for chapter 11, bankrupt. Now they have to deal with this entire thing. This is a very, very big topic. You will see this will also continue all the way into Q2. The good part about this, they seem to be having something going on with all the creditors. So maybe the creditors there are not going to completely get wiped out. Maybe they get 80 cents on the dollar or whatever. This is basically how January kind of started, right? So I said, great, going down this rabbit hole already, exactly as predicted. This is going to get really, really ugly. However, the good part here is it seems that there's some kind of negotiation going on. So if we're lucky, it's not going to get so bad that all the assets are going to get sold off or that, for example, the digital currency group has to liquidate Grayscale, where there's this massive kind of treasury in there, um, the, 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 the crown jewel, where they would have to sell off a lot of Bitcoin to kind of liquidate that, right? So I said, okay, not good, but it's not as ugly as kind of expected. And then from there, we also had Silvergate. A lot of this is with the crypto kind of crackdown, uh, with the crypto crackdown, the macro fallout, and I think it's a lot of the contagion as well. So I'm going to pull this into the entire kind of um, yeah, crypto crackdown because uh, we have these uh, in, the, in, the, in the entire kind of genesis uh, combination with the, with the fallout and a lot of the Silvergate issues didn't only stem from the crypto problems. So for those that are not aware of that, Silvergate, one of the crypto friendliest banks in the entire space, and they had issues with FTX already last year. And then on top of it, they had these duration problems with the bonds where they got basically bank run. And at the end, they had no more deposits left. So that was the next thing that kind of really kind of escalated all the way through February and really started spiraling up. On top of that, and that was something I definitely did not have on my radar, was Signature Bank. One of the prime banks in New York also having to shut down. And then now all the alarm bells started ringing up and said, hey, you know what? This is not only a contagion problem. This is actually a very targeted attack on crypto. But it was not so clear yet. If you just look at this one individual case, this was basically a bit of a bigger thing. And I basically had three kind of firms at the beginning of the year that I said, I think they're all going to get massive issues the entire year for different reasons. I said Genesis because they're bankrupt, Silvergate because they have so many issues with FTX, and the third one was Binance because of a lot of the regulatory problems, right? Watch the video, you can see this for yourself. Let's see a bit what happens. Obviously, the entire banking fallout completely peaked in March. We had these issues not only in the US, we had this also all over the world, Credit Suisse, we had Deutsche Bank, so now if we're kind of reflecting a bit, okay, so we have the Genesis kind of fallout, hmm, Silvergate, kind of okay, kind of expected, Signature Bank, that is now surprising because now we have a bit of an issue. We have the two largest US banks that are servicing crypto companies and they're not there anymore. So how do especially US customers on-ramp, off-ramp, how, how are they going to do this? Right? It's quite interesting now, how would this kind of work out? And we saw this, Circle had massive issues. USDC, this is also a big misunderstanding. People always say USDC depecked because it was trading at, I think, 86 cents or something. That's not true. USDC never depecked. The depegging would have occurred if you could not have redeemed USDC for dollars. 
you were always able to do it. It was just so unfortunate that on, over the weekend, which was always the case, we have a, a principal account with Circle. We know that. We could have always redeemed. It was just not possible on any weekend. And it was this very specific weekend where everyone got super nervous. So USDC started trading below a dollar, but it never depegged. Very big difference. I want to be very clear that actually the nomenclature here, many, many people misuse that. But a lot of this just kind of had this big fear in the market, right, in, in all this. So now we have this entire banking crisis. And now the big question is, how does crypto take this? Don't look at the price, right? Kind of make up your own assumption. And I think it's very difficult to make predictions here, but I would assume that especially the Bitcoin digital gold narrative, I think this would be very powerful for that, right? Many times narrative is stronger than the actual underlying facts. And I think that really played well into the entire narrative, like unbanking, get into Bitcoin, get into DeFi. So I would assume this is very, very positive. But then obviously there's a bit of the, the kind of left and right. So it's, it's not clear yet. So let's keep going. The Fed comes out and starts predicting, hey, you know what? Actually, this is looking worse from an economic standpoint that we had expected at the beginning of the year. We may actually not raise rates as much. We are actually predicting a bit of a recession for the end of the year, uh, for, for later in the summer. You have to be really, really careful. So this comes kind of in as well, if you kind of look at the entire kind of landscape. Then we keep going. Well, the labor market, especially in the US, and if you're asking why do I always talk about the US here, it's just because it is the largest economy, and for crypto, this is actually what really makes the prices at the moment, and it's still a lot of the US market. The US labor market doesn't look so terrible, but these jobs are not fungible. You have a lot, a lot of tech workers being laid off, and you see this all around the world. And then you have a lot of job openings that are not in tech, but that are more in the service industry. These jobs are not fungible. An engineer that works for Google and makes half a million a year at Google is getting laid off. That person is not open to taking a service job, I don't know, where this person makes maybe 30,000 a year. This is not fungible. And so a lot of these problems there don't show up on the data. However, me looking at this, I'm like, hmm, this may not look so good kind of going forward. Okay, let's keep going. Real estate. That's always the, 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 the big kind of scary thing. And one thing, and especially that kind of chart to me is really, really scary. We're seeing massive vacancies right now, especially in the US, and we see this all around. And also in Singapore, we've seen a statistic now where for the very first time since COVID, rents are starting to topple out and may actually start going down a little because landlords are expecting way higher rents what tenants are willing to pay. So this is really, really interesting as a, as a kind of uh, tendency in this. Okay, so now I'm starting to think, okay, the economy doesn't look all too good. That means a lot of people may not have spare cash. In consideration with all the other things, maybe I'm a bit neutral at you now. Maybe prices went up a little bit. Maybe prices went down a little bit. So that's me sitting in a super dark cave, not having access to coin market cap, right? And at the end, that's always what you kind of have to do. Okay, let's keep going. Now comes the juicy part. One news after the other. It all starts with Kraken. Kraken getting this entire kind of settlement with the SEC. It comes down to these uh, staking issues that they have. Um, they settle, they don't have to take any blame there. And they really already say, hey, we're moving away a bit from the US. This is only the beginning. Coinbase, serve the Wells notice. Now we're talking about the two most important exchanges in the US. But again, this is just the beginning. This goes down to protocols. This goes into Terra Luna. Now look, I'm. I actually agree with this crackdown on this, right? I, I, I really actually think this makes a lot of sense. But now we're gonna see that this goes against anything and, and everyone. Then we have the ICO crackdowns. We have Tron, today was um, Algorand. So like, it, it goes left and right right now, right? All comes from the US. And then obviously the huge one, CFTC against Binance, right? And I think people still underestimate a bit the importance and the impact of all of this. So. Seeing all this, and this is, I just added this because it came out today, um, not necessarily Q1, but Bittrex is now basically the, the last of the large exchanges. Gemini is pretty much still the only one that hasn't been served to notice there. So let's see when the fourth one, then basically all the US exchanges kind of got something. And that's kind of the, the last bit of a piece here. So if I have all these things, what would be my expectation? Well, my expectation is definitely not what actually happened. 
What actually happened was, with one of the strongest quarters, crypto had actually ever shown. And also the crazy part is, Bitcoin is the one who's pumping the strongest. Which, if you're telling me at the beginning of the year, with all these news, the last thing that I would predict is that price is up so much. And then if you're telling me Bitcoin is up 70%, then I'd be like, okay, I'm missing something here. Probably there's some crazy altcoin rally as well, and altcoins would be outperforming Bitcoin, because generally if Bitcoin pumps 70%, altcoins pump 100% or 110%. But the exact opposite is the case. Bitcoin outperforms pretty much any other coin. So what the heck is going on? Right? You, you, you really have to kind of analyze. Okay, Q1, I, let's compare Bitcoin, 72% up in a single quarter. You compare this to any of the other quarters, there's very, very few quarters that you can actually allocate where Bitcoin did better. So you sit here and you say, wow, I'm missing something here. Where is this pump coming from? Okay, let's do some further digging. Well, the stock market, quite an interesting, this is year to date, right? Quite an interesting distribution here. We see a lot of the tech companies, so tech tends to be up here, doing quite well. Some companies even outperforming. Facebook, Meta, 84% up, outperformed. Tesla, doing really well, 50% up. I mean, these are humongous companies. So now you're getting a bit of a sense and you're saying, hey, you know what? Tech is up, crypto is up. Okay, I see a little bit of some similarities. Generally, crypto and tech does have a strong correlation. Okay, I do get the banking side of things. Okay, banking is down. Hmm, okay. But why is Bitcoin up so much more than everything else? Okay, let's keep digging. These are the three major indices. The NASDAQ, generally the more risky kind of index, way, doing way better than the S&P 500. And the Dow Jones, and this is just crazy, is basically breaking even. While the NASDAQ is up, I think, over 20%. And that's really, really interesting. And if you just get this data, you're really starting to wonder, where's all this coming from? Why is this? Something is weird here. The economy doesn't look solid. Banking has an issue. What is, what is going on in this? So remember, we talked about all those points, and now we have point four and five. Four is all this crypto innovation. And then we have these known unknowns. And so I want to discuss this a bit on my theories on this. And this is going to be really relevant when we talk about Q2. So first and foremost, gold basically hitting an all-time high. Not exactly, but really, really close. You can see here, 2020, during COVID, very, very close. So now you sit there, okay, I understand the gold part. Like, that to me does not surprise me. Banks having issues, gold, Bitcoin, digital gold. Okay, then you look at the data and you're like, oh my goodness, central banks are buying gold at record levels. All right? these are central banks buying gold. We are going bonkers here. Okay, commodities, they are the absolute losers of the investment group in 2023 so far, especially looking at over the last year. Except for sugar, <laughs> everything else is down. Okay, so here's a really interesting analysis. And this analysis shows in my opinion, a bit of the behavior, how people, at the moment, they really want this V-shaped recovery right now. They really believe in everything that did super bad in 2022 must be doing well, must be recovering. This entire thing about a recovery. So what is, does this chart say? And I think this chart is so, so powerful. This chart says 2022 returns on the, on the x-axis the further left you are, the worse they did in 2022. On the y-axis, you see Q1 2023. So the worse something did in 2022, the better it did in Q1 2023. And the better something did last year, the worse it did this year. So you did see a very, very interesting, very psychological behavior. Not rational, in my opinion. It's just very psychological. And you can look 
the meme coins and the YOLO coins, you only live once. These coins, are, these stocks are doing the best out of all the stocks. To be honest, that AI is doing really well. I think no surprise here with ChatGPT, we're gonna address that as well. Especially also the AI coins. But I think this is, to me, one of the most significant slides. Because to me, I see a trend here that I think is quite tricky. I don't really understand it. I don't really understand why do these that did so bad last year, what changed? Was there a fundamental change? Did the economy get better in crypto? Is it better this year right now than last year? So these are just the questions that I would have in my decision making and what I think is gonna happen going forward when we're gonna discuss that. So let's keep going. One big narrative that I see that in my opinion is entirely false and I think a lot of this pumping is coming from is when people look at the so-called Fed balance sheet. The Fed balance sheet has been going down over the entire last year and this makes sense because the Fed has been selling bonds. So they've been selling this, thereby destroying money. And suddenly when this banking crisis hit, this balance sheet pumped up and it actually destroyed two thirds back to where it came from. And so people are so triggered by this balance sheet because over COVID, this balance sheet started going up and the trigger was, oh my, goodness, oh my goodness, they're all printing money. All these stocks that pumped in 2020 and 2021 that all got hammered in 2022, they're gonna pump again. And this is this trigger. And here's the problem with that. Assets on this balance sheet are not created equal. There's a huge difference between what happened in 2020 and 2021 and what happened this year in order to make that backstop. That backstop right now is nothing else than the banks giving a loan to these really, really like troubled banks and says, hey, here's money, but you have to pay it back with interest. And that money that's being given out shows up on this balance sheet. Now, I'm not saying that this is not liquidity, it is, but it's very different kind of money, different kind of assets then what happened in 2020 and 2021, where the Fed basically went and said, here, and you know all this symbol where you see the money flowing around, where the Fed went and just started throwing money and giving money to everyone with no conditions attached. It was just, here, stimulus checks and another stimulus checks, like Oprah running around, like, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car, and everyone just gets free money. Humongous difference. And to me, this explains so much when you look on Twitter or you look on Reddit, you look on Telegram, people always kind of show the slide and say, oh look, money's going up, all these assets are gonna pump, just like 2020 and 2021. And I would be very cautious in believing that because these are two totally different types of assets on the Fed balance sheet, but the Fed balance sheet here just tracks all the assets, but these are completely different ones. So don't get fooled with this false liquidity. So if you have been really, really lucky in investing into those things that did so extremely well, again, don't take financial advice from me. But if I were so lucky and had invested in those and I didn't, I, I wanna be honest, I didn't, I would probably take profits in those right now just because I would be happy that I made such great returns and be happy with those right now. And maybe let a little bit ride, but I would probably take some profits. Okay, let's keep going. The next thing is the US dollar has seen, this is the US dollar here, has seen a, a significant weakness against all the other currencies. And now you see all these news reports coming up and you probably have seen those, where the news report is, ah, Brazil and China are trading and Russia and the BRICS countries are starting their own currency. The US dollar is dying. Who has seen these kind of magazine kind of outlooks in the, in the last uh, kind of um, weeks or days. Yeah, I also have seen this 2004. This is not the first time that this pops up, right? So this story about the US dollar dying, I believe the US dollar is dying. But be very careful if you believe that the US dollar is dying in the next year. Like there's so many people who make money by trying to install fear in you and they drive action with fear. And many times this is very, very dangerous. I invest in Bitcoin and I invest in crypto because I believe the dollar is dying. 
but I don't think the dollar is dying this year. I think this is going to take decades, 10 years, uh, 10 years, 20 years, not one year or two years. It's going to be, the, the dollar is way too sticky and the US is way too strong to let the dollar die. These kind of things of new world currencies, I mean, this is the story here. China completes its first yuan settled uh, natural gas trade, liquid natural gas. Well, Iran did the same thing over 10 years ago already. These stories get always dug up and people love to share them because they love to fear monger. One beautiful thing, and I wish I tried to find screenshots, but I didn't find that. But if you look for the old gold books, right, you can look at those really old books, like 50 year old, where people tried to convince you to invest in gold and put all your money in gold. It's exactly the same stories that you hear today. The dollar is going to die in the next five years. They're going to give you all these calculations on why the dollar is going to die in the next five years. And this has been the same thing for the last 50 years. Again, I'm not saying that the dollar is a great investment. I don't think so at all. I'm just saying I would be very careful if all you're doing is betting on the dollar dying right now and you're going all in to hedge yourself against the US dollar. Also, those stories when people say, get out of the US dollar and go into whatever, go into the Swiss franc or go into the RMB because the dollar is dying. I don't know. I, I think there's, so, there's such a strong agenda behind this that I just always struggle a little bit with this. Right, so I, when I see this and I, I hear these reasons that this is one of the reasons why, I don't know, crypto is doing so well, I struggle a bit believing that because I know that enough smart people don't fall for this stuff. They've been through this before. Yeah, maybe some people have never seen these news articles, have not seen this before, but enough smart people have and they're not gonna fall for this again. They've fallen for this in the past and they don't kind of fall for this right now. So going with this, Let's really ask, who is buying? Why is Bitcoin pumping so much? Is it whales? Is it those that have really, really deep pockets? Well, whale addresses, so here, this is the orange line, has been going down consistently over the last months. It's not whales. Okay, so if it's not the big pockets, maybe it's the shrimps, it's retail. Well, retail interest can be tracked really well because you can look at like you can look at YouTube views, you can look at book sales, you can look at app downloads. You can go on Google and just track this yourself. Go and search for the trend in Bitcoin and Google. The trend is relatively low here. So, who is buying? Well, okay. We do have innovation. Using talked about it. The Bitcoin ordinals, I 100% believe they drove part of the Bitcoin hype in Q1. I 100% believe that. And you can see this activity on the Bitcoin blockchain is up because of that. I also believe Ethereum pumped, and I mean, I don't even think we have to think. I think we saw it over the last week. Ethereum did like 10% since the Chappelle upgrade over the last week. And I think it's going to do really well going forward as well. So this definitely has some impact, 100%. But does it justify being up 70%? Okay, we know one guy who's buying 100%. Michael Saylor been buying. I personally think this is, he should, my wish would actually be, and look, Bitcoin is the largest uh, treasury position from crypto in our company. So I wish that Saylor would actually stop buying Bitcoin and I wish he would start funding companies who build on top of Bitcoin. Because to me, he does have too much already allocation in Bitcoin. He owns one out of, one of every 150 Bitcoin. That means almost 1%. I mean, it's great for the price short term, don't get me wrong. And him buying like, I don't know, I think he bought like $200 million in Q1 is definitely fantastic short term and it definitely helped. But long term, there's nothing worse than having one person sitting in the freaking US with all this crackdown right now, having Bitcoin on their balance sheet, and we're talking about billions, and being basically a honeypot for the US government or for the SEC to go and say, you have to sell your Bitcoins, otherwise we're gonna shut down your company. There's nothing worse in my opinion for that, right? So I would rather have him start investing in, I don't know, Bitcoin companies, companies really focused on Bitcoin. He is such a Bitcoin maximalist, fantastic, then build the Bitcoin ecosystem. I would prefer that than him just accumulating more Bitcoin. Because what does this help me? 
To be honest, the fewer people own Bitcoin, the less the value of Bitcoin is. Sure, maybe the higher the price, but the less the value. Right? Bitcoin is very different to a company. In a company, it doesn't matter if one person owns the company or 10,000 shareholders. In Bitcoin, there's a humongous difference if one person owns all the Bitcoins or 10,000 people. So, I'm not sure. I mean, sure, he helped the price, but then there's a flip side to that. The US government had actually announced that they had sold about $200 million worth of Silk Road Bitcoins. So it may actually very easily be that he just bought the US government's Bitcoins. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry, this is this part. And the US also announced that they may continue selling a billion dollars worth of Bitcoins in Q2. Now, interesting, the government has never announced such selling, so it could more be that they're trying to scare everyone rather than actually doing anything else. The threat many times is scarier than the actual execution. Okay, so who is really buying? And I'm telling you the data on this is really, really clear. We know exactly who is buying. We don't know who this is, but we know the process. And it's those who are selling stable coins, specifically BUSD. Now, I see a lot of really, really bad kind of social media around this where people say, oh, this is just Binance manipulating the market or that's Binance washing their money or this is Binance, I don't know, creating fake coins. I don't believe any of that. I actually think this is completely legitimate. Just a simple thought experiment, okay? Binance's trading fees are how high? Who knows? What are Binance's trading fees? 0.1% on spot, right? And then obviously they have futures, options, whatever. So let's say 0.1, okay? So if you do, let's say average, $30 billion in trading volume a day, and I think for Binance, that's probably an average if you look at this, and it's 0.1 average, how many days of this average do you need to accumulate $30 billion in treasury? 1,000 days. 1,000 times 0.1 is 100%. So that's about three years. Binance has been existing since 2017. So in the first year, 2017, 2018, let's discount this. But 2019 till 2023, that's three, four years. And when you see the entire trading volume that Binance has, Binance owns 92% of the spot volume in the entire market, specifically of Bitcoin, 92%. It's not far-fetched that Binance has tens of billions of dollars in their treasury. Now, not all of it is going to be super liquid in Bitcoin or Ethereum or in dollars, but some of it will be. And so that's just a very interesting behavior. At the beginning of this year, that's the 19th of December, the BUSD market cap was around 22 billion. Now, we don't know who owned those two 22 billion. But the assumption is that definitely Binance owned some of this and maybe some of the users. And you can look at all the analysis that like these stable coins always do, there's very few people who ever say that they own BUSD. They always say, oh, I own USDT, I own uh, USDC. Very few ever say that they own BUSD. So the assumption can be reasonably that a lot of these $22 billion are actually owned by Binance. There's nothing bad about this. There's nothing wrong about this. It's actually a very smart move by Binance because they have this white labeling solution with Paxos. They can brand it with their own name. They control everything. Plus, maybe they have a revenue share on the interest that they make. So Binance many times actually admitted that they don't have access to a bank account. So that way, suddenly, they have access to dollars. And so now, they may have gotten a notice, just what Paxos then had to do public, which is BUSD has to be shut down, another US crackdown move. And Binance knows about this and says, OK, you know what? We need to get rid of our BUSD. There's nothing shady about this. It's completely legit. So if you are Binance and it's beginning of December, so here, so it definitely must have happened. So they must have gotten the notice after the 5th of December because here we still see a peak. Let's say you're CC and you have all these billions of dollars of BUSD. You cannot redeem them because you don't get a principal account. It's very likely they don't get a principal account that they can redeem them directly. And now you have billions of dollars of BSD and you need to get out of those BSD. What do you do? Very simple. You announce 
Who knows? What, what, what did Binance announce in December? Coincidentally. They announced free trading of BUSD against Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other stablecoins. Plus, they announced free conversions of all stablecoins into BUSD. So think about this. So at that point, I, had no, I didn't pay attention to this at all. I was like, I didn't pay attention to this. I only started paying attention to this in March. So over a month ago, I started to really track this because I thought this was so suspicious. Not illegally, just like understanding what the price does. So imagine this. There's free, no fees, trading against BUSD, and all stable coins that get deposited to Binance automatically get converted to BUSD. And that got announced, track, check it yourself, go on the Binance website, look it up. This news is still there. What would you expect the BUSD market cap to do? Well, if you ask me, I would expect it to go up because there's more trading, all the stable coins get converted. And what happens to the stable coin market cap, BUSD? It starts dropping like there's no tomorrow. It goes from 22 billion within two months to under 10 billion. That's insane. We're talking about 16 billion, 17 billion dollars that get moved in around two months. That's not peanuts money. This is serious money, right? We're not talking about 17 million. This is B with a billion. Makes no sense unless whoever owns all those BUSD needs to get rid of them. And in my opinion, this is what happened the entire Q1. And I'm telling you, 95% of people are not paying attention to this because they get blinded by so many other things. Now, those few who do see this, for some weird reason, they put a bad word against Binance. And that's not what I'm doing at all. I think this actually makes a lot of sense. I would have done the same. And there's nothing wrong with this. It actually gives you, in my opinion, a really good insight. And I've started tracking the BUSD market cap every, like at the moment I'm at, I, I was at 50, billion, uh, 50 million, but that was too, too, too broad. So here's just like, let me give you a very concrete example. This is the entire market cap of 2023 in stable coins. This is at the beginning, that's uh, January 11th. And that's three months later. USDC sold off 11 billion. Makes a lot of sense because people really lost trust in USDC. USDT gained 12.2 billion. The tracking of USDC is actually really good. So most people on the blockchain track that and they can see that there's a lot of conversion from USDC into USDT. So as soon as USDC gets deposited, many times USDT get minted right afterwards. So people assume a lot of this is just conversion. These 9 billion, no one knows what happened to them. They just got sold and something else was bought with this. Now, this is just the last week. This is the last week. We had nothing going on until the 11th of April and suddenly, and, and you can track this yourself. I mean, this is, again, this is really crazy to look at this. And on the 11th of April, suddenly the market cap of BUSD goes down by around 400 million, 350 million. That's serious money in four days. Quiz question. On what day do you think did crypto start pumping? Normally, in normal circumstances, when the market cap goes down so much, crypto dumps. It dumps because that means liquidity is sucked out of the market. Unless these stable coins get actually sold into Bitcoin. They're not dragged out. Well, Look what happened on the 11th of April. Suddenly the market shoots up. Look at today. Today, 20 million of BUSD got destroyed. Really, half an hour later, Bitcoin pumps up 2%. Now, of course, this can be just coincidence. I get it. You can track this back the entire quarter. There's people on Twitter who do nothing else. It's insane <laughs> how close the correlation of that is. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to be very clear. It's actually really, really valuable because it gives you really nice insights on what to expect going forward. 
And that to me is the key thing. If you walk into a tent and that tent is complete dark and you don't know what game you're playing, who's your opponent, you, can, you have nothing. And then someone says, do you want to bet on your position? Do you want to bet that you're winning or you're losing? The natural reaction is, I have no effing clue. I'm not going to bet here. And what do people do on crypto? They're like, I have no effing clue. Let me go all in. Let me go leverage. <laughs> That's the typical behavior of the like, D-chan investor. But the more information you have, the better the light, the better you understand the game, the better you understand who you're playing against. And this is really, really key. So when we're going to talk about Q2, this is going to be a key thing that I'm going to be tracking. And the other thing that's being tracked here, and you can calculate this yourself, while all this BUSD got destroyed, the Bitcoin reserves of Binance increased by 70,000 Bitcoins. And you can calculate this up, and just coincidentally, it's exactly, not exactly, but it's very roughly to that amount of BUSD that got destroyed. So the evidence is very, very strong. There's nothing wrong with Binance doing this. I want to be very clear. To me, it's just something I want to understand. If I don't understand what's happening, I stay on the sidelines. If I very much understand what's happening, I'm willing to put more chips on the table. And because I start to understand what's happening, in March I started to, like about six weeks ago, I started to put more chips on the table. Because now I know what to look for. Now I know what to track. So there's two things I'm tracking. I'm tracking the on-ramp into crypto. That's the market cap of BUSD going down. As long as BUSD starts going down, I'm expecting the market to go up. However, the question is, whoever is selling all those BUSD, what is this person doing? What is this entity doing? Are they staying in Bitcoin or are they exiting? And this is the big question because Binance does have by far the largest spot volume dominance still today. It's very, very, very powerful. And now they announced a new thing and that is that they're offering zero fees on true USD. True USD's market cap with this announcement was like basically almost zero, like I think a billion dollars, even less. And since this announcement, the true USD market cap keeps going up. So the two things me personally as an investor and as a CEO in this company is monitoring is the market cap of BUSD keep going down. As long as this thing goes down, I expect the markets to go up. Unless the market cap of true USD keeps going up, then I think whoever is selling is going to buy true USD and sell Bitcoin. And that's my entire game plan actually for Q2. I want to be dead honest. That's the number one factor that I'm actually going to be watching. So would I bet my entire house on this? No, because I still don't know everything in there. I don't know who it is. I can only assume. I don't know the exact decision tree that this person has. I don't know when this person is going to change their strategy. I don't understand if this person is going to stay in Bitcoin long term because then that's going to be very bullish. I don't know if that person just waits for the market to jump on, for retail to FOMO in because they're missing the train, and then they're going to dump. Max Payne theory. But it's something that I feel very few people are talking about right now because they don't understand it. People don't, like I said, it's a dark tent. They're sitting in there. They see nothing. They don't know the game. They don't know their position. They don't know the, 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 the other player. And they go all in because they might get lucky. This is not how I like to invest. And it's definitely not how I would risk our company assets. So summarizing everything that happened so far. Outperformers for this year. Three, Bitcoin ordinals. Insane hype. I think if there's just one thing right now from a technological standpoint that really has hype, it's Bitcoin ordinals. The second thing, AI coin prices. They did probably best as a coin group. It's not a coin, that, or a coin group that I would dare to invest in because I'm not sure if these things are sustainable. And then I'm actually borrowing this quote from a VC that I met today, or like caught up, and he said he's very bullish on AI tech, just not on dot AI companies, <laughs> meaning it's just those companies that go and they like were whatever social media companies before, then they became crypto companies and now they do dot AI. So he says he's very skeptical of that. So I just copied that and put that here. So I think AI tech, big winners, no surprise here, just not dot AI. Big losers for me the entire quarter. Lightning Network, 
at the moment, this thing has 70,000 users stalling. This thing needs more push. It needs more real world use case. It needs to have easier user experience. Otherwise, that thing is not going to get forward. I would hope that Sailor would invest way more here than just buying Bitcoins. Altcoins by far underperformed Bitcoin, by far. Right? So like I know all the DFI holders here, including myself, we underperformed Bitcoin. But every altcoin did, and you can compare this. It's, it's madness. And the last thing, crypto US, clear underperformer. And I'm probably expecting this to get worse with what everything the US is doing. Okay, let's shift gears and let's look for this quarter and see what's happening. And then we're gonna have, when we do the next meetup, we're gonna reflect on that again. So what are 10 predictions for the next quarter? First thing, whatever pumped the prices in Q1 is gonna be the continuation or the discontinuation of Q2. You need to come up with your own theory on this my theory is crystal clear. I'm watching BUSD, I'm watching true USD. As simple as it is. That to me is gonna define the prices for me in the next quarter. Now, obviously, I do believe that Ethereum will actually start outperforming Bitcoin now. It did over the last week. I think with the Chappelle upgrade, that's gonna continue. A key event is gonna be mid-May because there is a almost $600 million loan due from the parent group from Genesis went into chapter 11 in January, and they need to pay that to the creditors of Genesis. So the big question is, does the digital currency group have that money or not? Key question, let's see. We, we don't know. If they don't, this may cause the next contagion effect. Fingers crossed they do, because otherwise that's, that, that would get ugly. Let's see if the US is not just signaling that they're gonna sell a billion dollars of Bitcoin, let's see if they're actually gonna do it. What's going to happen to the rest of the crypto crackdown? Was Binance just the beginning or was it the end? What's going to happen to the economy? Is there going to be a recession? Real estate, any issues? Can Europe be like the replacement for all those companies that are in the US right now? I don't think that these companies will go to Asia just because the Asian market is so different to how the North American market is or how the European market is. The Asian market is very sequestered. There's so many different jurisdictions. It's very different to how North America or Europe is. Europe has one thing going for it, and that's the Mika regulation, which is a crypto markets in crypto assets regulation. And that could be very interesting. That could get approved now in Q2. And if you saw just today, actually Coinbase posted, and it was like very telling, Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, posted a picture of being in Europe and meeting with European regulators and European decision makers. So I think he's sending a very, very clear signal. He says, bye bye US, if you keep acting like this, we're gonna to move to Europe. Then obviously we're gonna watch the Fed. And I don't know if you've heard about that $1 million bet from Balaji. Balaji bet um, in March that he thinks Bitcoin is gonna be at a million dollars by the end of, or by the mid of uh, uh, June. And why is that? Because he thinks the dollar is going to die, just like all these headlines said. Again, I tried to take the other side of that bet. Uh, he was betting on a million dollars. I tried to put up a million dollars to bet against him. He didn't accept that. So uh, pity. Uh, if, if anyone here wants to do it, I'm volunteering at the end. So you bet your side, I bet the other side. Um, yeah, so I don't think the US dollar is going to die uh, by the end of Q2. But obviously, if it did, then this could be incredible bullish for the price. So, Bitcoin cycle-wise, let's summarize, let's finish with a couple just very, very charty kind of slides. I'm not the chart person. I always think this is like more astrology than anything else. But let's look at a couple of things here. This is the price channel that we're in right now. It's that fourth kind of epoch. We do have a little bit of upside still here if we're kind of following this, and then we should see a little bit of a sidewards trend, especially from May onwards. Um, if you're following our Twitter space, is always on every Tuesday. Our head of community, Fabio, he's of the firm belief right now of sell in May, but remember, be back, he says, in December. So not in September, so he thinks we're gonna see a bit of a rough six months from May onwards. Uh, he's always that person who loves charts, so um, if you're more of the chart person, then uh, Fabio is your guy. Um, out season, at the moment we definitely had Bitcoin season. I do believe once that selling of Bitcoin, uh, that buying of Bitcoin stops, 
that afterwards we may see a bit of a reshuffling, people searching for yield. So it's normal that once Bitcoin season, and we have seen Bitcoin season all of Q1, Bitcoin was the winner, just like we always see this, we may see returns, and this could actually be now in Q2. So I actually could foresee that we may actually see a, a alt season here. Um, again, I said, if you like charts, I'm not the big fan of charts. Uh, if you like charts, then this is not a good sign. This is 2008. We're here. This is 2023. We're here. Um, make up your own stuff. Uh, again, I'm not much of an astrologist, so uh, I leave this up to your imagination where we're going to go next. Um, interest rates, another chart. Um, where we may peak, and I think um, this is not too unexpected. Maybe we see another race. Um, in May now, and that's it. So I don't think that uh, entire interest rate topic is going to be all too exciting. Last but not least, I think the scenario that I would be scared the most is if we do have a lot of this doom and gloom, where suddenly there's like a lot of fear in the market, a lot of problems, and suddenly we're going to see this very loose monetary policy again. MAS has now signaled they may actually stop because we may see some issues. I, I'm okay with, if MAS stops, I'm okay if the Fed stops. I would be a bit worried if they go too aggressive in easing the market and trying to raise prices because then we're going to see this stagflation, we're going to see this up and down. And this to me is a really nightmare scenario because this like destroys everyone's wealth and it's very, very difficult to actually attain it. So I would rather have that we could actually see a bit of a, of a recession now in Q2, Q3. I'm okay with that as long as then there's this cleanup and then we keep going down. So yeah, with that, I know that many, many people believe here, we are here, and now this is a way up. I know that many, many people are in this cycle. I just wanna caution you, we may easily be somewhere here. Maybe we are just here, complacency, and we actually see that big drop I don't belong to this group that thinks we're going to see lower lows in this cycle. I just think it's not, it's not the time right now where I would go aggressively all in. Because for me, it's so difficult to know whenever, whoever is buying all these Bitcoins right now, what is this group doing? What is this company doing? Who is this person? And what is their decision making tree? If they change their mind and they start selling, we're just going to shoot down again. And so since I don't have this, I stick to my strategy that I've been holding on, I think over the last four or five months already dollar cost averaging. I think this makes a lot, a lot of sense right now. And keep a very diversified portfolio. That's just really, I think, like my personal kind of strategy. Also our company strategy. We have crypto allocation. I think it's crazy not to have crypto allocation right now because crypto rips and it's just the returns are insane. But I also see those people who are all in and then they get super nervous when these markets kind of fluctuate super nuts. With that, I wish you a really nice evening. Thank you so much for coming. Obviously, if you're not a customer yet, I hope you become one of our customers. And if you have questions, you can ask us afterwards. We just, yeah, uh, want to leave it at that. So thank you so much. Yeah. Questions? No questions? No. Too late.